first panel discussion of the day which is on upgrading the curriculum examination assessment and engagement by digitizing the k-12 education the panelists for this session are dr madhuri parthi who is the head of lakshmipat singhania education joined by mr sudhir kukareja who is the co-founder at credence international schools and credence edutech mr sudhanshu agrawal who is the business head of north at imax by class lab and Mr. Sarvesh Srivastav, who is the co-founder and MD at UPS Learning. The moderator for this session is Mr. Utkarsh Lokesh. Panelists, please take the stage. So, uh, thank you, panelists. And I will straight away jump into questions because I think during the questions, you can kind of introduce your roles also. But uh, Dr. Madhuri, we'll start with you. And if you can share on your digitization journey uh, in your schools and what's the current state of digitization in your group of schools. I think um, our journey of digitization started in 1999 when we first came up with Jill uh, um, classrooms where like what we have smart classrooms today. They just started their journey and we were, uh, I was working with Ryan's at that point in time and we were a big group. So the litmus testing was done with us. And I think since then I always felt when I was a student yeah, in physics, there was a chapter where you had to talk about a diesel engine and a petrol engine. And I could never make out the logic behind the two. I just, because a teacher kept telling me that that question is going to be for five marks. So I would always like, you know, kind of learn up the whole process without understanding and just go and vomit it on my question paper. I mean, that would be the first question I would look for if it's there. I would just write it in fear that I might not forget anything. But when I saw the same thing in the classrooms, now, when children can see it in three dimensions, they can understand what is the difference. So it, I think learning in three dimension with digitalization has changed the entire, we used to imagine that there is a small intestine and there is a big intestine on a NCRT ki thakke hue paper ki kitab ke saath hamare zamane mein we used to see. But today a child can actually see it in 3D and even in 5D now. So digitalization to that extent of learning is one thing. Then using digitalization for children and using technology to learn various aspects of life is another thing. So we've been participating in a lot of international competitions which are cyber based, which are technology based. So like. Um, there's a competition hosted by the US government called Dorsal Diplomacy. We have been participating in that, where children are supposed to do a lot of research work, collaborate with children from around the world and participate. Yeah, so we've been participating in a competition called Cyber Fair, again, where children from all around the world participate on a single uh, topic and put across their opinions, debate, argue, bring in their point of view from their culture, their perception. So there's a lot of learning. Skype in the classroom is another module that we use in our schools. Although some of our schools, I work with JK Group as their head, some of our schools are in the uh, tier three cities where there's nothing. But one good thing is since our schools are plant-based, we have the facility of web conferencing. So we use that facility to our best even being in tier 3, tier, some of our paper plants in, are in tier 4 towns which you would have never even heard the name of. But we, because of technology, our children are ab able to collaborate with the whole world and create something new. We talk about bringing Bloom's taxonomy top level, top level. But how do we bring it into our classroom when we are in tier 4 and we have limited resources? So technology has enabled us to bring global classrooms into our tier four schools also. So Thank I think you. I'll leave it here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's a great start in terms of use cases. So uh, Sudhir, how how have you seen the journey and kind of how what's your digitization vision probably for this uh, group of schools? Well, uh, if I have to talk about Credence International Schools, I think uh, technology lies in the genesis of our beginning or maybe the birth of the group right 
I don't know if I've shared with you also or not. I have been associated as a national head with one of a very renowned school chains in India before I started my own company way back in 2001. I won't name the group. Let's drop that for a minute. Um, but trust me, it's one of the biggest groups in the country today, the most premium ones, one of the premium ones, I would say. But my three years of working there, I tried my level best to integrate or forget integrate to introduce some sort of a technology into that system. But probably because that system was so old and so big that to bring in something new in that particular system and get the acceptance from everybody across the board was really a challenge. And given the young group of people that we actually founded this company, we were kicked about the technology integration into our system uh, right from day one. So even before we launched our first school, um, this company literally started from my drawing room. My first four employees were a part of the team which started operating out of my drawing room and we started developing our first tech platform and those kind of things. Um, you know, the curriculum itself. And then the first line that was given to the team was that, uh, you know, in our schools, wherever you'll find them across the country, Every teacher has a mandate that if we teach a subject over a period of 10 days, 15 days, a topic or a chapter is what I'm referring to, for the first five days, a teacher is not allowed to touch the textbook. So that's a simple rule across the country that we follow. Sarvesh may not enjoy this statement, but we do get the uh, textbooks in the system after a while. Now, let's just imagine what changed after we introduced this one rule. Because teachers were so used to teaching with the textbook, the whole idea of the classroom was that go into the classroom, open a textbook, maybe give a five minutes talk, 10 minutes talk to introduce the topic, and then, you know, go on to the rote learning process of it. So the moment I said, okay, first five days, no touching the textbook, it was like a bouncer. So what do we do? inside the classroom and that is where you know the answer to that question is is where the entire quest for looking for a practical experiential tech oriented tech enabled thing came into the picture so our focus was technology but we really did not want to say that okay we'll do only technology so we created a nice blend of what is experiential so we created a math lab uh, sort of an equipment uh, I'm sure a lot of people sitting here, so we've recently had a, uh, you know, just now had a math presentation, and I believe maths, I do agree, though it's my favorite subject, but it is one of the most dreaded subjects across the country among the students. But why is it so is a question mark. So I love mathematics to the extent that I went on to ask myself that, okay, why I, so you know, I love the conversation that was happening here between the why and a how of uh, the whole thing. And I said, it is really worth bringing it up. So uh, in our schools, what we've done is we've really tried to ensure that we address the why also, and we address the how also. Yeah, for example, uh, I'm sure I'm sitting with an elite group of people here. I have a question to ask. Pythagoras theorem, how many of you have heard of it? Almost everyone, right? I have a question. I'm a student, class five, class six, wherever you introduce this, and I have a question, why should I study this? I'm sorry? I think that rule will apply to the whole mathematics, or for that matter, all subjects, yeah. Height of what? You know what? I'll tell you something. This is a classic textbook question which is there in every match book. There is a tree and you have to measure the height of it using the perpendicular. Let me ask you a follow-up question here. I was literally waiting for this answer and trust me, I'm elated to the core. Next question. How many of you have really calculated the height of a tree using Pythagoras theorem? <laughs> Look what we are doing to our students. Yeah? Now let me give you a reason why do I want my children, and this is what I do across all my schools, I tell them the why. Yeah? I tell my fourth class, fifth class, sixth class, wherever I introduce, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't remember that. I tell him that you need to study a Pythagoras theorem if you wish to become an airplane pilot. 
Have you all taken, a, I'm sure all of you must have taken a flight every time. Yeah? How do you know, you must have heard of the announcement, now we're flying at 30,000 feet, 33,000 feet, etc., etc. How does a pilot know that he's flying at 33,000 feet right up of there? He's using a radar. I'm sorry? He has the altimeter. He has the altimeter, but what, on what principle is it developed? So there is a laser beam going down and coming back, measuring the tri you know, speed of light, calculating the time travel and to go down and come back, and that's how the height comes into the picture, number one. Number two, how does a pilot flying at 33,000 feet knows exactly where he needs to land on the airstrip? Any answers? It's once again the angle of depreciation which you apply. That's exactly Pythagoras theorem. So I want my kid to study Pythagoras theorem to give him a purpose in life. He needs to study coordinate geometry if he aspires to become an architect. He needs to study every topic. I think every time a teacher enters inside a classroom, she needs to first establish why. And trust me, that why has to be way beyond the basic knowledge and examination. Yeah, so one of the, you know, uh, subjects in our topic is assessments. Trust me, the teaching, the day you disconnect it from assessment, I am not saying assessment is not important, but that's not the purpose. The unfortunate part is that we made it a purpose, we made it the objective. The moment you take it away from there, that is the time when the true happen, you know, learning happens. And I'll go to one more point before I stop. So ma'am talked about something called as a digestive system, which is now we are able to see a three-dimensional figure and rotate it, etc. I'm telling you if uh, whoever uses a Apple phone here, I'm sorry, it's only there on the Apple right now. So across all our schools, we have iPads for every child and every teacher. And uh, we are not only using it for 2D and 3D content, which is displayed. I think that is something which Educom introduced way back in 2004-2005. With AR, VR, etc. sort of things now coming into the picture, digitization has made it possible. How did we actually learn digitize, uh, you know, this digestive system? So we were probably shown a photograph or a chart or maybe in that science lab that model. Today, you know, when I walked inside a classroom, I'm sure each teacher sitting here will agree with me. When I go inside a classroom teaching, whether 22 students, 25 students, 30 students, at the end of 40 minutes, I'm never sure that whatever I've taught, all 40 have understood it. Yeah? Now, here is a tool which can actually help you do that. So if you use an Apple device anywhere, uh, it can be an iPad, MacBook, phone, wherever, there is an app called Build a Body, which basically gives you parts of the body in one row, an open skeleton, and a child is supposed to just drag and drop the parts of the body. Now my teacher inside the classroom is not supposed to go in and tell how to assemble it. The moment you touch a part, its description comes there. The child is expected to read, understand, and then apply. So that is what is, you know, the, the modern pedagogy, I believe, which needs to come in, which a teacher needs to facilitate with the help of digital world, which is enabling them to, you know, become more of facilitators rather than just teachers, and which will help them, you know, get away from that rote learning process and help them, you know, uh, sort of get into a status which is self-learning. And I think, I think I'm think i sure that there, there would be Android or other alternatives Absolutely. for this. Yeah. So there are some apps which are exclusive to Apple. Correct. That's the reason yeah. we went for it. Uh, but then I think now, ma'am, like she said, so over the years we've realized that the moment I go to a tier three or tier four city, resources become a challenge. So we've now started developing a lot of apps on Android, but we're catching up. Last seven yeah. years we worked only on Apple, but now last one and a half year, we have worked on the Android platform as well. Yeah. And like I mentioned in one of my previous things, it's not necessary that you need to spend a huge amount of money to integrate technology. We were discussing mobile phones. So there is a program called Apple for Schools and Google for Education, which we are using extensively across all our schools. Assessments like we were discussing. And Apple. I think they have also launched Apple Teacher Certification for te uh, Teachers, basically. That is free. Yeah, just, I think probably two days back. I read it on your website yesterday, and I was so <laughs> glad to read it. Most of my teachers already have that certification. Awesome, so awesome. we are like one of those first groups in India. Three of our schools are actually identified as Apple distinguished schools for you know integrating Apple system into that kind of a product. Great. So Sudanshu, uh, from your perspective, because there are a lot of questions uh, for anyone working with schools uh, being asked to them actually. So 
some of them if you can mention and kind of what improvements at, at the main question is what improvements ultimately you bring in uh, if you introduce digitized classroom so if you can comment on that sure so i like to take a step back i think so uh, what we need to also look at what digitization actually is so from my perspective when we look at digitization it is anything that is helping me or my uh, or my partner schools to uh, reduce the burden increase the efficiency and making a non digitized work into a digitized work let me take a small example a different analogy from a different industry let's look at the uh, retail industry a uh, couple of years back we used to go to the market we used to travel down we used to go to a shopping mall or to the kiryana stores we used to identify what we need to buy and then a lot of time and energy was spent into it and let's look at the recent things developments which have happened let's look at amazon for example now amazon has brought the digitization of the entire retail industry and the similar companies which has actually helped us sitting at a home to order and to uh, to kind of uh, have anything and everything delivered at our doorsteps so what am i doing i'm actually saving my uh, i'm increasing my efficiency and saving my time i'm reducing my cost and perhaps also getting the same stuff at the uh, at a better price now drawing from the similar uh, uh, analogy i think so in within the education sector also and within the school specifically anything that is improving my efficiency anything that is reducing my burden and also bringing the much larger outcome in the classrooms which are tangible in nature that is what digitization is now how do we do that how do we do that now over a period of last couple of years we have seen there are lot of solutions and lot of uh, uh, which a lot of solutions which have come into the classroom one of the small examples is digital boards however when we look at digital boards in a stand alone situation they do provide a very uh, a very short term experience to the child and to the teacher that there they can be there can be an enhancement in the learning but if we look at from the larger perspective it also at the same time increases the burden on the teacher to identify what needs to be taught using a digital board it does not replaces the current system and it is the same content which is fed to the all the learners in the classroom so we were talking about personalized learning we were talking about how do we engage everybody in the classroom so but however if you look at digital board the same content is being fed to the 40 students all together so here is where uh, the need right now in terms of digitalization in the classroom is can we have a solution rather than having piecemeal solutions which are presently available in the market something which addresses all the key stakeholders which is teachers parents students and the school administration so that is where the need of the digitization is and that is where i think so we as a uh, imx at uh, uh, have been able to address it to about 1300 plus schools across the country wherein we have been able to bring a systematic approach in digitization which is providing a standardized curriculum to the schools they have been able to efficient of uh, it has able to uh, efficiently improve the teachers time which is being utilized into lot of non digitized work so let let me take a small example writing diaries the lesson plans bringing a standardized curriculum in a digitized format as well as something which is easy for implement for implementation for them has really helped the teachers to use their time more efficiently this standardization this structure has also helped the teachers to focus on to the classroom environment and look at the tangible results that they have been able to bring out in the students through a personalized learning format so these are some of the aspects that we have been able to capture very efficiently in the last couple of years and that's what we are doing thanks sudanshu uh, sarvesh same question to you what improvements do you think we can bring in curriculum uh, assessment engagement through uh, design of learning solutions uh, so uh, let me start with uh, sudhir put uh, put a question to me <laughs> uh, uh, how many of you feel that textbooks are going to stay for some time in india as far as education is concerned so <laughs> so so i think i would like to talk about uh, 
something different as far as curriculum and how digitization can bring effectiveness into the curriculum as far as uh, achievement of learning outcomes is concerned. It's, it's to do with how do we curate the digital components with the physical ones. That is very important. If the digital components are not talking to the physical components, we will have chaos. And that is very important. Today, digital, through digital methods, we can address many things which cannot be addressed through physical form. Let's take language learning, for example. It consists of LSRW skill, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Many of these skills cannot be effectively addressed through physical form, which is the textbook. We need to have digital intervention for efficacy of the learning, is, uh, as far as efficacy of learning is concerned. So, the point I am trying to make is that uh, it is the solution which is very important, as you also, sir, spoke about. How a solution can be made which addresses parents, teachers, students, the physical form, the digital form, all working together to achieve the learning outcomes that we desire. That has been our learning and at UFES, that is what we are doing. We are designing solutions using instructional design techniques on how and what should be digitized, what should remain in the physical form and thereby offering a solution which we feel will work more effectively. So, so but how do you get to know on the improvement? Like, um, uh, for example, how do you connect it with assessment? Because you mentioned about the man like compulsion of digital intervention, but how do we do that? That's, that's very interesting. So, within the digital components, we have components which assess the outcome through uh, 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 adaptive techniques. So, using adaptive techniques in assessments, we are able to find out what has been the learning outcome and what has been the weakness areas, what have been the strength areas. And therefore, we'll be able to offer remedial action where there is need and not try to address everything which may not be required by the learner. And I think, I think that's something also probably IMAX is known for in terms of bridging physical, digital, and then uh, that part of the uh, remedial solution. Right. So, uh, see, it is important that when we are talking about replacing anything, it, the replacement is not just as a that we need to bring everything digital. I think so what we need to look at is what is, what can, what Sir said, what can be replaced as a digital and what cannot be replaced as a digital. Let me take a small example. We see a lot of assessment companies in our, uh, which are present in the industry, which provide digital assessments for the schools and the teachers. Now, if I may ask, do they replace the existing assessment system in the school? They come as an over and above the existing system in the school environment, so which means it is increasing the load on the teacher, now which does not motivate the teacher to conduct those digital assessments. Now, we as an organization, for example, we haven't replaced the existing system in the school. The system in the school is a pen and paper assessment. However, the backbone of the assessment which goes is completely digitalized. So we conduct the physical paper in the class school system, which is as per the school, whether it is a formative assessment or a periodic assessment, as we call it, mid-year or annual assessments. Based on that, we use the data or the power of data 
and we use our digital platform to identify the need gaps of each child and the areas of strength of each child and then personalize the learning and then create a personalized remedial system for the child. So digitization does not mean that always it has to come as a burdensome for a teacher or any of the stakeholder in the learning process or even while replacing something, it should be something which I mentioned earlier, that it should be efficient enough for to be replaced so that it saves my time, it saves my cost and gives me a much tangible output. Get it. Just to add, just to, add uh, to what you are saying, uh, two techniques, one you have already spoken about, which is the analytics part of assessment. The other is the artificial intelligence part of assessment. If you combine both, the assessment no longer remains just an assessment. You know, it is no longer summative in nature. It becomes formative in nature. So it will give feedback to the learner on where they are going wrong, why they are going wrong, what are the remedial steps that can be that have to be taken, and the same can be shared with the parent as well as the teacher. So it reduces the whole burden on the system. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, my question to Dr. Pathi is, uh, you mentioned some great use cases and competitions that students participated and so, when students do that, I'm sure the feedback is positive, probably from students and parents, if you can comment a little on that. And also, if the feedback is positive, which I'm guessing, why aren't other schools doing that is what I want to know. And how can we help uh, more schools achieve that? Okay. I, yeah, it's working. I think first and foremost, let's understand one more thing, like when all this debate was happening. People sitting here, we are all teachers at heart. What we are all here for, or when we are in our schools, what we want is the best for the children. And today, with all this technology, all the AI, I mean, my grandson was in Singapore last year, and he sends me a video. He has been Sunita's student. He sends me a video where he gives onions and capsicums and everything to a robot, and he prepares an omelette and gives it back to him. The housekeeping of that hotel was entirely being done by robos. I'll get you the name, okay, if anybody's interested. That's a hotel in Singapore. So it, I mean, I saw it, but it gave an alarm in my mind, right? So my mother-in-law was unwell last year, and my sister-in-law was here from Ohio, and every alternate day, sitting in the corridors of Apollo Hospital, she would be calling up her robot to clean her living room or her bedroom. Yeah, Roomba, clean my bedroom. Again, it rang an alarm in my head. There's so much technology happening. These children who are still in kindergarten, grade five, are not in their productive years as yet. The kind of scenario that they are going to face is another big issue. Assessments, learning, pedagogy is one issue that we all need to discuss. But the other issue is also how are we going to handle this world and the children from next generation after the millennial generation is another big question that I would love all of you all I'd like to leave you with this thought that what are, where are we heading? You know, these kind of things raise big alarms on my head. And coming back to Lokesh's question, uh, I think these, uh, the amount of uh, 21st century skills that we have talked about in last decade, one decade we've all been talking about collaboration, creativity, and uh, creation and everything. These competitions that I'm naming, are competitions that make them happen real time. All these competitions have rubrics which are peer evaluation based. So every school from the world which is participating is making one website, but then there are six other schools from other parts of the country who review it and evaluate it. 
and evaluation is on almost on 92 parameters covering everything under the sky that you could possibly think of. This, there are, see, there are enough resources available today. Technology has brought so much to our plate that it's difficult to handle everything. There are free resources like Khan Academy, there are paid resources. It is for us as educationists, as teachers, as heads of the schools to decide when to give what. Like we just, when our children are young, we decide no, how much portion of what we are going to make and give to our children. It's the same thing. Availability is in abundance today, paid, unpaid. You have to choose what is it that your school needs, how much is to be given and when it is to be given. When are your teachers ready, when are your parents ready, all the stakeholders what we call. When they are ready, when you have prepared them, bring on a new thing, bring on a new thing. There is enough resource available today. Whether it is uh, digitalized text, whether it is uh, experiential learning, whatever area that you talk about, enough is available. Sure. Sudhir, uh, from an assessment perspective, I want your uh, ideas on it as well, how you leverage tech, technology or even uh, other strategies for a quality assessment and also how you probably involve parents in the whole uh, ecosystem. So, uh, like I mentioned, so first I agree with ma'am because any educationist, I believe whether it's ma'am or anybody else sitting in the house, including me, uh, I'm an ardent supporter of technology, but at the same time, I really didn't mean that we intend to replace the textbooks by any ways. Uh, it's a balance, right? So I absolutely agree with the line which he used, what is to be given, how much is to be given, when it needs to be given, and to whom are you giving it? So the requirements of a IB board school would probably be different. The requirements of an IGCAC would be different. The requirements of a CBSC and ICAC would be different. Requirements in Gurgaon would be different from Delhi, probably Karnal, Haryana, Punjab, etc. Wherever you travel, they will change. So as school leaders, I think we all really need to sit down and take a very comprehensive review of where do we stand? Where, where does our ecosystem stand? Where do our parents stand? Now coming to your point, how do we engage the parents? So I talked about a program called Google for Education, which we kind of implemented in our schools only for the engagement and assessment purpose. So at the end of every lecture, uh, which we do, especially in those first five days, which I'm talking about, uh, a teacher in our school typically will send something or the other back home to a parent's mobile. Now how Google for Education works, I'm uh, right, it is, so you can create a classroom, a virtual classroom online, and connect every parent's, uh, every child's parent on that platform. So whatever you're teaching inside the classroom, some material, it can be a reading material, it can be a slideshow, it can be a video, it can be anything, is immediately sent. So my schools normally get over at 3.30, children reach home by 4.30. By four o'clock in the evening, we have sent that material before the child reaches home. So the parent knows just because of the technology that what is it that the child has studied or I should use the word learned in the school today, which he can contribute to. So that's one part. After the initial five days are over and then we move to the textbooks, that's the time we start using the same Google for Education platform for assessments where we will probably have objective type questions. We will probably use something like a survey monkey or a Google form to create objective question sets, which are once again sent to the parents mobile using that Google for education, which is free of cost product. And it reduces the effort on the part of the teacher because all the questions are objective in nature. The parent needs to sit together with the child answer all the objective questions. By the time the child is back in the school next morning, you have the result of it. So there is a topic, so you don't need to do the corrections also. It is automatically done because there is a key that you already defined. Yeah. So by the time I deliver a lecture in the classroom as a teacher, the child goes back home, solves an exercise and comes back, the assessment of the learning of an individual child is also done. So next day when I take a revision of it, I get a, you know, data that, all right, I taught these three things yesterday and of these three, two things, everybody has answered correct. This one thing, 50% of the people do not understand. So let me stress a little more on that. So technology can actually help you create that sort of an engagement and that sort of a 
efficiency in that overall process. It just needs an intent and maybe, you know, some bit of an extra effort at, at maybe at the leader's level. So I understand that, yes, it is a burden at times for teachers, but maybe as leaders, we probably, so we literally have two, three people in our school who are dedicated to develop only those objective questions. Maybe solutions like IMAX at that point of time can be helpful, which provide you with such things, I'm assuming, so I have not really gone into the details, where you have these things readily available. Yeah. And that's what you blend along with other physical math lab and those kind of things which we are talking about. Get it. I just want to uh, bring that up because thanks, uh, Sunita, for bringing that up in terms of Having a common vision is great, but kind of how you deliver or you the different pedagogies for preschooler or a, probably a 10th grader is different. Is That is something that probably not many schools bring a difference uh, there as well. So uh, I'll open the floor for questions if you have for the panelists and probably then I'll jump on to my own questions. Sir, yourself many things because uh, you were talking about technology as well as you told that we cannot replace books also. Even the way, uh, uh, ma'am, I have a question for you. That you said that, of course, a lot many te technologies are there and uh, we are using swipe with in your interior uh, tier five groups. Mm -hmm. But can, as you said that your time was very difficult time as you have to uh, study everything with the third grade paper of CBSC books or NCRT books. Yeah. Even now those books are valuable. And we cannot produce a single Arya Bhatta who studied from, uh, I don't know, the paper or the um, what kind of books were there at that time. So, of course, digitization is happening. It is doing good. It is uh, helping the students to learn. But it is not able to replace the old method of teaching. So, my question is simple. I mean, so how can we replace the books? How can we grade that a paper is very uh, poor or it is not good? Uh, means I'm, I'm no, uh, no. unable to okay, understand okay. that. Okay, you're taking it in a different... Give them what they want, how they want. So it, it's not about uh, the quality of paper. I come from JK paper, yeah? But, come on, but, I can't but, be talking but about but that time. <laughs> but that time, uh, technology was not there. So we had to study through that only. Yeah, so we cannot but, put a question mark on that. That is my concern. We cannot put a question mark that... No, no. I, what I was trying to say was a 2D picture versus a 3D today. My so question was not, not about available. 2D and 3D. Even 2Ds were not available at that time because television, uh, it came later on in the picture. Yeah. So what I have studied is a 2D picture. But today children can teach... I mean, there was somebody uh, had come to give a demo for a biology lab. It was almost a 5D lab now what they demonstrated to me. So from a picture which was black and white to a 5D lab is a great transition that we have. The idea is now there is so much resource available. So how do we make those Arya Bhattas will depend on the leaders and the teachers. That's my take. So even then the rote learning is going on. We are describing the things to them. Nothing new is given to them. They are not given any experimental kind of things because we are showing pictures, we are showing uh, ready-made worksheets to them, just giving them practice. What uh, earlier they, uh, she was saying, uh, that uh, we are giving practice to them, worksheets to them, nothing else. Nothing creative is there, nothing experimental is there for them. No, there is enough. In invention is going on. No, no, sir. I disagree with you. There is enough available resource. You go to Khan Academy. You go to all these cyber fair and resources that I'm talking about. There's an, that's exactly what I'm saying. There's, earlier, there was the source of learning was only the teacher or the book. There were only two people who could teach us uh, the curriculum. Today, there is so much resource available to teach. I mean, for me, digestive system meant either I listen to my biology teacher or I read it in the book, right? But today, if I want to learn about the digestive system, there is so much resource available under the sky that it is unimaginable. It's only for the teachers parents and all the stakeholders to decide what to hand over to the child. That's it. Sir, it's, it's, it's really not about replacing anything. Let's first come to that. It's about how do we enhance their learning ability. So one was listening to a teacher. Two was 
you know, then the book was probably invented. So we saw a photograph of a digestive system. Three, we talked about a video when Educom came in. Fourth, I gave you an example of an app where you can actually integrate a digestive system. Fifth, which I just recalled, now there are schools which have implemented something called as a 3D printing. So the other day I went to a place where there are kids who have actually printed a heart and opening it up with walls and etc. The idea here is, we're not saying that, okay, let's throw the textbooks and go to a 3D printing. Not at all. What we're suggesting is that learning processes and the methodology has evolved. Uh, do you think hearing it from someone and actually building it with your hands will give you a different experience and a learning? If the answer is yes, I think that's what we are advocating. That's my first. Exactly. That's what is important. Correct. Yes, which is important. And in fact, I'll answer one more question for your replacement thing. So I guess Utkarsh might want to, and you might want to go to an EdTech conference, which I uh, attended with Utkarsh uh, in Chennai. So there was a person, you remember the name of the keylo keynote speaker there? Geek Schools? Yes. Uh, uh. Shivam. Uh, okay, so Shivam. the keynote speaker at Chennai conference, I'm sure the videos are available and you can watch it. You know what, when we want to change something, it's, it's very easy for us to say that, okay, things are not changing. But changing things takes guts. And I'm really thankful to Utkarsh to find out that person. I don't know, how did he find out that person? To bring that person on that stage, I loved that session. So I'm talking about a couple, a guy who was working with Microsoft and his wife who was working with Boeing. I believe they were earning in crores, settled well in US, IIT, I am sort of background, came back to India, running a school since last two years. And you can't imagine what kind of a school they're learning. Yeah? Yeah, it was Sridhar, absolutely. Sridhar. Correct, thanks Rana. So Sridhar of course started off that session. You know what that school is all about? They call themselves a geek school. And I love that concept. One, they don't have classes. Can you imagine a school without classes? We were talking about replacing books. So there are no books in the school, correct? correct. There are no books in the school. There are no classes in the school. So they have segments. So there is a kindergarten in which class a age four to age six studies together. And then there is a primary elementary school where age six to 10 studies together, all of them together. And, and so they had similar questions from parents like absolutely. Sunita mentioned. But that parents me, come to them and ask, what, how, how do you do, do that? that? Yeah, and then you know the important part where I was coming to, it takes patience, effort and guts to do it. And changes you know this people. guy, these two people, hats off to these people. I'm saluting them in their absence here. They are running a school since last two years after leaving their cozy jobs, more than cozy jobs in Microsoft and Boeing. I asked him how many students you have in your school. You know what's the answer? Last year six, this year 32. Imagine surviving the school with like that. After leaving a job in Microsoft and Boeing, but he is on course to change things. It will probably take him a generation to do it. I'm not saying it's gonna to change tomorrow morning, but there is a person who's taken that step. Are we willing to do it is a question mark. And we have changed from our Gurukul system. So I'm now going a little philosophical. We have changed from our Gurukul system. So, to so one, right? one last question we can take and probably uh, then Utkarsh, we can... Utkarsh, before that, that, I'd like to give an example. It's raw, it's crude. How many of you came by bicycles today? You didn't. Great, <laughs> awesome. How many kilometers, I'll check with you later out in the coffee. So I'd like to add here, I think it's a very interesting point which is made here. See, any transformation, when we're talking about whether digital or any kind of an intervention and transformation, I think so. it's very important that we address all the stakeholders in that transformation. What happens, what I was mentioning a point earlier, that we have so many piecemeal solutions that addresses only a specific stakeholder in the school system at times. So if we address a teacher, student, parent, and the school owner or the administrator who is running the school, if all the, all the stakeholders are taken care of when we talk about transformation, when we talk about replacing, that replacement is not only uh, reducing the burden, but also increasing the efficiency and the output. I think then the transformation becomes complete and then the journey also becomes much smoother. So it is not only addressing a student or a teacher, but also addressing a parent at times. Someone was raising a question during the keynote speaker, that how do you address the parent? I think so, that is when the transformation is being decided upon, that we take into consideration all the, key, all the stakeholders in the system and start addressing them. So thank you panelists and thank you audience.